Hello, I'm Michael. Today I'd like to present to you Chopin's Sonata for Piano and Cello in G minor, Op. 65. This is the last of Chopin's composition to be published in his lifetime and is dedicated to his good friend and a cellist, Marcus Franco. It's a rare work by Chopin that featured instruments other than the piano and is one of his three chamber works. Three of them all included the cello. This sonata is an undervalued masterpiece that has been frequently overlooked and is the music that Chopin asked to be played on his deathbed. So here's my agenda for today. First, I'll introduce to you Chopin the composer. Then I'll uh, give you an analysis and some links with other works of this cello sonata together with uh, an interpretations comparison. Frederick Chopin is a Polish-French romantic composer, and he is regarded as one of the best pianistic composers in history. His all compositions feature the piano, and he has contributed much to the popularization of both Polish folk music, like bazookas and polonaises, as well as single movement solo pieces like the ballads and nocturnes for piano. But his chamber music output were relatively neglected. So here is the life of Chopin. He was born in 1810 in uh, Sobobola, Duchy of Warsaw. And at the age of six, he begins to take piano lessons. And the next year, he published his first work, Polonaise in G minor. And in 1826 to 29, he studied in the Warsaw Conservatory. It's then that he composed his first chamber music work, the Polonaise in C for cello and piano. And in 1832, he has his first concert in Paris, and he met with the ch cellist August Franco, the delegatee of this work, for the first time. And in 1837, he began a 10-year romantic relationship with George Sand, a French uh, female writer. And in 1847, this cello sonata is published, and he died two years later on October 7, 17. In Paris at the age of 39. So uh, the cello sonata is composed in 1845 to 46 and published in 1847. So this is Chopin himself and the one uh, of further is uh, August Franco, the cellist. This is a four movement sonata, so the four movements are listed here. But you may notice an unconventional order that is the scherzo and the largo which are uh, usually placed at the third and the second movements respectively, uh, reversed. But actually, when we look at his other piano sonatas, three of them all has this kind of order, that the minuet or the scherzo is placed in the second place and the slow movement at the third place. This cello sonata is Chopin's two-year painstaking process of rewriting, and he actually said that sometimes I'm satisfied with my sonata with cello, and at other times I'm not. I throw it into a corner only to get it up again later. Because he finally considered the sound characteristics of the cello, not only backing up the piano, so he placed two of them on the equal status. And we can assume that the delicate Frank Holm, he probably contributed more on the cello part than Chopin himself. He also realized that this sophisticated work might not be well received and understood by the Parisian audience at that time. And the musical elements of his other late works are also present here, like the emphasis on mystique rather than brilliance as in his Polonaise fantasy, and intricate counterpoint as in his fourth ballad. So we will mainly talk about the first movement today it begins with a seven-bar piano solo introduction, and it consists of four cello themes, each with different characters. Some of them act as the introductory passages to new sections of the sonata form. The first subject here begins similarly, similarly as the piano introduction, with dotted upbeat rhythms resembling a funeral march.
The second subject is preceded by a buggy or festival passage. It has an abrupt change in character, tonalized in the Neapolitan A flat. It is also followed by the transitional section. The third subject is almost like speaking and begging, so the cellist should use an enunciating bow. It is followed by the second theme in exposition in the relative B flat major. The fourth subject is again right after another fortissimo passage. It is lyrical and pathetic, with a brief crescendo to prepare for the piano entrance. It is followed by the closing theme in D minor this time. So as you can see, almost all openings of new materials are announced by solo cello entries a few bars before. Also, this is a free key exposition, meaning that uh, there is a G minor section, a B flat major section, and a final D, D minor section. And like his second and third piano sonatas, he omitted the principal theme and transitional passage in the recap, which begins directly with the reprised second theme. So I'll play for you the beginning of the recap. The Chinese Sonata was premiered in Chopin's last public concert in February 1848 in Paris, a year and a half before his death. Chopin himself played the piano while the delicate Franco, the cellist, played the cello. But actually, only the last three movements were performed that day. So this is very unconventional because the opening movement is usually regarded as the most important of the work. So, uh, Perhaps the first movement was too physically demanding for the terminal of Chopin, but uh, a scholar called Anatole Lykin offered another view. He proposed that the similarity between the first movement of the Cello Sonata and Schubert's Song Cycle, this arises in 1828, uh, forces Chopin to omit. The opening half step motif of the sonata resembles the contour of the first song, Good Enough of Winterizer in uh, by Schubert. So I'll play for you uh, this opening. Oh, boy. 
and the text of Pindaras actually depicts the sorrows of a man pan from his loved one in despair. So perhaps it is parallel to Chopin's painful separation with George Sand, which is uh, around that time, 1845 to 46. And musically, it would be embarrassing for the audience to notice the Hinterreiser reference. And emotionally, Chopin himself might not want to recall the agony of separation. So here I will uh, do a comparison between two interpretations of the cello sonata. One is by uh, Yo-Yo Ma and Emmanuel X, and another is by Misha Maisky and Martha Argerich. Uh, Ma and X use rubatos delightfully. Their music is clear and more conversational, and at one instance, a real man chose to play an octave higher near the end to show his skills and convey a moving emotion. Let's have a listen. Maisky and Agarich use way more rubatos than Ryoma and X. They are of course technically immaculate, but often the music turns into a duel between them, and sometimes it gets a little bit too blurred for my taste. So let's have a listen as well. Bibliography list of this presentation and it's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.